Dr. Swift. Thank you, Madam Chair and Trustees. You've been um, very much aware that we are living in interesting times for this budget cycle. And trustees, we have spoken uh, behind the scenes to discuss the fact that we most likely will not have a budget until fall. Um, every day, Mr. Dimitro is discovering more, um, sorry, more detail about our uh, budget outlook. So I know that our nine, FY 1920 budget update has been a standing item for several months now, and yet, trustees, I appreciate your patience because there is more for us to clarify, um, it, particularly in this year where you will be passing a budget which you're required to do by law, trustees, by June 30th. Um, and yet you will be passing that budget without a state budget. And I know Trustee Basquette and perhaps Trustee Lightfoot have lived through this before, but for most of us, we've not personally experienced a year without a finalized budget prior to June 30th. And so with that, Mr. Demetri, take us through um, our update. Thanks. Good evening, Dr. Swift and trustees. So um, we're going to start with some of uh, state considerations, um, some of the information. Um, and this slide just shows uh, the per capita income, and it shows uh, the ones in black, the United States and Michigan. And you can see that we're trailing about 5,000. Uh, national. This is through 2016. Uh, and you can see in the past we were a little bit above or just exactly the same as the federal in the, and in the last probably 15 years we have, um, uh, we have fallen behind. Um, this shows the percent of taxes that are collected as, as or personal income as, as uh, state and local taxes. And you can see that in Michigan we're way below the national average, so we're, we're not, uh, we're taxing way below the, the, um, the U.S. average. So what does that mean? Um, in, in Michigan, we have in a constitution a limit how much we can collect in state taxes, which is 9.49%. And <clears throat> this green line shows, uh, this dotted line shows the 9.49%. And then the green line is shows what we are actually collecting. And, and you can see when Proposal A passed, we were at the limit. And <clears throat> actually, which was right here, I'm sorry. And uh, when Proposal A passed, there was also $4 billion that was being collected locally that went to the state. Um, so over time, you can see that that has, starting around 2000, that we started going below the, um, the, the max. And where we are right now is about $10 billion below what the um, constitutional limit is. Um, and, and you can see that a variety of, of tax cuts and so forth is was, it's not the economy. In 08 or 09, could have been the economy right here, but uh, after the economy has, has rebounded since then, but the uh, taxes have not, and there are reasons. Uh, part of the reason is because of tax cuts, and you can see that the, the biggest one in the business tax is $2 billion. Also in property education taxes, this is again business, uh, this is for commercial personal property, which is basically equipment in primarily in um, businesses and, and, and industrial. Um, so this just shows the, the variance in taxes, the variance between 2008 and 2016. That's around two, 2011, 12 is when most of the tax cuts took place. And this shows the general fund that back in 2000 is about 10.7 billion, and then in 2019 is actually um, 10.6 billion. So um, there hasn't, due to the tax cuts, the general fund 
hasn't grown at all. And um, what what happens is that the school aid fund has been pretty much supplementing the general fund. So the school aid fund is basically um, is there to maintain and support a system of free public elementary and secondary schools as defined by the Michigan Constitution. And, and it was defined uh, by um, a previous uh, attorney general and, and the courts that uh, higher education is included in secondary schools. So that's where we have now the school aid fund paying for colleges and universities. Um, and this slide shows where we were when Proposal A passed that the general fund was actually contributing to the school aid fund, about $665 million, and that right now we were about um, almost $800 million. There's some, some ins and outs, but it's about $800 million that the school aid fund contributes to the general fund. And the biggest piece is the um, colleges and universities where 900 million, over 900 million are going to colleges and, and universities. So I, another thing that just happened in lame duck in December is the, the, um, the legislature voted to take some money from uh, the school aid fund, which is there, and you see 150 million this year, 173 next year, and 182 the year after, to for the roads and also to for environmental cleanup. Uh, so the school aid fund now is paying for roads and, and environmental cleanup. So another issue that uh, all the public schools have to belong into the Michigan Public School Employees Retirement System. Um, and Michigan ranks six uh, as far as how high uh, our rate is, and this is a couple years old. And, and this doesn't in, the six does not include the unfunded, audited, accrued liability when, which is the in and out, but it's still part of our expenditures. So when that is included, then we're only behind Illinois how how expensive our retirement system is out of all the states in the country. Another thing that's been taking place is also the budget stabilization fund. It's one of the funds that the state has. And the state has been basically storing uh, money for um, the rainy day, I would say. And that is at, uh, at this point approximately one point, almost $1.2 billion. That, um, and it's expected to grow by at least f um, $50 million a year, where Detroit, due to the um, grant deal that they received, they will have to pay back some of the money. So about $50 million, and then plus interest, uh, which should be another 30 or $40 million a year. They only show the Detroit payments here. They don't show any investment income that should be coming in. This shows the history of uh, foundation increases and decreases and um, the 2x formula going back to almost the beginning of Proposal A. And, and you can see that in some years... Um, there's been the 2x formula. Sometimes it's been a more than 3x. Uh, most of the years it's been a, a 2x formula. And this is where everybody received a $470 decrease. And in here, we also, uh, an honorable public schools, lost another $233 from their hold harmless. Um, and statewide, fund balances, as, as school districts receive twice as the increases in the foundation. A lot of the school districts have made up that $470 and, have been, and they didn't have to deal with the $233 decrease. Only about, at the time, only about 40 school districts where um, they were deducted the whole harmless portion of their foundation. So most of the school districts have rebounded and then their fund balances are a little bit over 12%. Um, so, um, in, in, on the state side, 
uh, state revenue is down and, and, it's, and it's due to the tax effort, it's not because of the economy. Um, if uh, the state and local taxes were at their national averages, we'd be collecting about $3 billion more in taxes. And if we were taxing the way we were taxing uh, back in 1972, we would be receiving, an, there would be another $15 billion in, in taxes collected. Um, so going to our school district, um, our foundation, which is 9,410 currently, uh, it's, it's made out of three components. Two of them are local, the 18 mills, the whole harmless, which stays constant, the whole harmless. And then whatever, this is set by the state, and whatever we do not collect locally, then the state makes up. So you can see that we collect more locally than actually we get from the state. A share locally is bigger. Um, so our foundation, as um, you've seen this before, we're at 9,410, and in 05, 06, we're 9,409. And then you can see also that in 2008 and 9, which is 10 years ago, we were actually $313 more per student. We were higher in 2008, 2009 than where we are today. Um, so going through the calculations and, and factoring uh, the consumer price index, you can see that over these 13 years that we only received one dollar increase, that if you just factor um, the consumer price index, we should be receiving our foundation just to cover inflation should be 12,114, which is an additional $2,700 per student. And based on our enrollment, we should be receiving just this year alone, 48 million, uh, 48 and a half more million dollars just this year alone. So if you do the math for all the 13 years, it is $359 million that a number of public schools did not receive um, just to cover inflation. So fund balance, what is appropriate? There's um, from the Michigan school business officials, they recommend 15 to 20% of expenditures. The GFOA or Government Finance Officers Association they recommend about 60 days of operating expense, or if I'm balanced, approximately 16%. In our own AAPS policy, it gives us a range between 6 and 15%. And, then, and this, then the state has the early warning legislation, which we'll talk later, which is 5%. Um, so our fund balance, uh, we have our last audit shows it at 18 three or almost 18.4, which is 7.2%. And then a budget, uh, we expect at the end of this year when we close the books to, buy, to be about 6.2% or 15.6. And you can see that we had some years that we grew and then the last uh, three years basically we are using some of our fund balance. So this shows um, our number of public schools is in blue. Some districts that are, I, I will call them high achieving school districts from all over the state. Uh, and you can see their fine balances that, um, uh, and then the yellow line is the rest of the state. And th they're kind of similar where you can see where they went down and, every, and then they started going up. And the same with the rest of the state. And we were following the state until about here and then we started going down. So the last couple of years, we have not followed what the state has, has been doing. As far as days of operation, if you remember, it was the GFOA that was recommending about 60 days. Uh, last started, we were at 26. If we are correct with our assumptions or this year's budget, we will be down to 22 at the end of this year. Um, where uh, money comes from, you can see most of it comes from a foundation. And if you remember correctly, about $90 million out of this 162 comes locally. Um, the uh, Act 18 money that we receive, uh, it's, it's about 12%. Also, this retirement in and out uh, comes from the state. And then we have other categoricals and federal grants and, and so forth. That makes another 15%. 
As far as our expenditures are concerned, you can see that our salaries and benefits are about 212 million, the combination of these two. Um, and then purchase services, which is uh, custodial maintenance, uh, transportation, contracts we have, and technology and so forth. And then we also have a little bit in supplies and materials. A different way to look at our breakdown of our salaries and benefits. So you can see our, our salaries, uh, approximately 127 million. And this is from our last audit that we have. Um, and this is our, our retirement contributions, including the UAAL, our health insurance, uh, FICA, and other benefits that we have. As far as where is the money going, and, and you can see that uh, this, uh, and then ninety-five percent of the money goes directly into into the schools, um, and then even the support areas basically, is, you know, support the schools. As far as our um, salaries and benefits, and you can see over five years that they have increased by twenty-seven percent. It doesn't mean that we gave raises of that, but our expenses are increasing, whether it's health care, whether it's retirement, um, additional staff, uh, all of those, including uh, collective bargaining agreements, have contributed to the increases. As far as our enrollment, and, and you can see, uh, we have been on an up, upward trend. We did have uh, a blip over here, which you'll see in a minute. So in 2014, fiscal 14, we lost 207 students, or 1.26%. And then you can see that the, uh, ever since then, we have been increasing enrollment. But in the last uh, couple of years, the increases have not been as big as they were before. As far as staffing is concerned, over the five years, uh, you can see that we have added approximately 468 positions, or, um, but if you look at very closely, uh, the approximately 99% of all uh, new employees are actually located in schools, uh, whether they're teachers, uh, para pros, office professionals. These are uh, assistant principals. When elementary go over 500, they get an assistant principal, or uh, the deans. Um, and they're all pretty much located in the ASCA, they're all located at the schools. As far as student pay teacher ratio, and this comes from the Michigan Department of Education Bulletin 1014, which basically is the number of students divided by the number of classroom teachers. It's not all the members or, or um, employees that are covered by the uh, AAEA. Uh, this is just the classroom teachers, and you can see that we went from 22 on the average in the school district to 19, which is a reduction of three over the last five years. As far as uh, pay, we, uh, and, and shows the number of school districts and charter schools. Again, this is the, from the Department of Education, Bulletin 1014. And <clears throat> And you can see we have ranked between 31 and 4, and we believe that, that this 4, um, it, it was a big jump in, in one year, and then back to kind of normal. Uh, this is the average teacher salary, but we're in the basically top uh, fourth percentile. Uh, so we ranked 28 out of 825 school districts and charter schools, and the average teacher salary in the state of Michigan uh, is 61.9, which, which we're about nine and a half thousand uh, dollars higher than the average. As far as um, spending on a per student basis uh, for salaries, again, looking at those school districts that are in green, uh, in Ann Arbor is in, in, in blue, and then the state is in yellow. Kind of the same line, we're just at a higher rate, we're just spending at a higher rate for salaries. Looking at benefits, again, you see the same trends. Uh, we're just at a higher, at a higher level than, than everybody else. 
looking at their retirement, and you can see how their retirement has increased over time, um, our retirement cost. And in the shaded part is basically the part that is the unfunded, uh, audited, accrued liability. As far as the retirement rate, this is a couple years old, and you can see some states in what is the burden on some of our funding that we have to pay into the retirement system. Currently, this is approximately 40% for this year. As far as healthcare, again, you can see how healthcare has increased over time. So with the governor's proposal, as Dr. Swift mentioned earlier, we, um, every day we get new information, whether it's from the state, whether it's from the ISD, um, taxable values and all those kind of things. So we, we are making adjustments every day. Um, so based on, on the governor's proposal, uh, we expect the financial impact uh, of all the ins and outs to be approximately $5.4 million. And there are some, um, this, does, is, this has to do with Act 18, and this year we received $2.7 million. Uh, we were told by the ISD to expect about, it was in December, they had extra money, and then they had to give it to us, that we should expect about 60% of that. So that would be a reduction of about $1 million for us. Uh, we're expecting our Act 18 to increase by uh, earlier, by approximately a million and a half, but as we got numbers from the ISD, it's only 700,000. So, so we're making adjustments um, as, as we go. On the expenditure side, we expect um, our expenditures um, to go up by approximately $8.8 .8 million. Part of it is because of the categorical money that comes in. We have to spend the money. So this is like kind of in and out, this one million and a half. Um, but everything else is um, it's kind of normal. So just um, looking at our revenues, even with the governor's proposals, it's five point right now, and, and it could change. Uh, we expect our revenues to increase by 5.4, and then our expenditures by 8.8, .8, which means we would be approximately, we would have a shortage of approximately $3.4 million. So we're looking for ways to uh, eliminate that. Um, as far as how much do raises and steps cost, so the, the cost of steps is approximately $4.7 million, and just a 1% increase for the rest of the people that do not receive steps it's approximately $1.8 million. And this number, is, it includes the FICA and the MEPSIS portion. Uh, so totally, it's $6.5 million. So some of the reasons to have a fund balance is obviously um, we, we don't receive our first aid payment until October, so we need to have enough cash so we don't have to borrow um, in, in, in a fund balance. But also it provides stability when we have unexpected cost and so forth. Um, and whatever that causes, if it's enrollment losses, if it's uh, utility bills or whatever, you, we have money to weather those unexpected events. Um, the early warning legislation, but basically what it says is that if we have less than 5% for two years in a row, then um, the states, the state basically gets involved, and the, the, depending on the severity, they could even appoint an emergency manager. Uh, some of the information that we would be submitting to Treasury for approval, um, you can see they're all listed here. Um, so they would approve our projections, they would approve a budget, and um, so this, uh, they would be heavily involved in, in our operations, basically. So in closing, um, the state of Michigan basically has reduced its tax effort, and the effects of doing that has dramatically affected Ann Arbor Public Schools, where our foundation is the same that it was 13 years ago, and, and the impact of during these 13 years is about $360 million. 
Um, our average teacher pay is approximately 28th in the state out of 825. We spent more than the average in Michigan on benefits, uh, in salaries. Our fund balance in the last couple of years has been reduced, and we expect the same thing to happen this year. Um, the cost of um, basically steps and a 1% raise approximately $6.5 million. And uh, at the end of this year, we expect to be about 6.2% in fund balance. And then the early warning legislation is at 5% after you're lower than 5% two years in a row. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Before we uh, go to questions, Madam Chair, if we can touch on the status of not having a final budget in June, just what are the steps that we would be taking in that case? Yes. So uh, it, when we don't have a budget that when we don't have a budget from the state, as far as uh, we still have the requirement to adopt the budget uh, as a school district. And it's up to us to determine what estimates we want to put in a budget. Um, so we would do the same things that uh, we will have a finance committee where we'll go through a budget, we will have a first briefing at the board, we will have a second briefing where the budget will be adopted, we will um, have to advertise when that will take place in a newspaper, we will have a budget hearing um, where people can come and uh, talk about a budget, we will post a budget at least six days before it is adopted. Um, so. Uh, we have to go through the same steps um, and uh, that we normally do. And then when the uh, legislature adopts a budget, then we will probably have an amendment because we, we have no way of knowing, um, you know, we, we, we'll, be very, um, we'll be very lucky if we can budget exactly what the legislature will come up with. So once the legislature passes and the governor signs the education bill, then we will make an amendment to, to adjust to, to what is passed. Thank you. Thank you. So trustees, I appreciate your courage in, um, as you always do, persisting despite the reality that we face. Um, as I have discussed with you in private one-on-one -on -one meetings, if you look at slide 43, um, my team and I are vigilantly monitoring what are the internal measures that we need to take in order to deliver a budget to you trustees that does not any longer dip into fund equity. I do understand the leadership of the board two years ago to give some long overdue increases. That was important to our organization. And yet today, right now, it is important that our organization remains strong. And so I will continue to brief you as we move through these next 30 days or so uh, and we get clearer on how we're going to avoid impact on the fund balance, because I believe that is my job to deliver that to you, and we will do that in the least impactful way possible. But as you saw, with 90% plus of our budget being people, and most all of those people being in direct contact with children or in direct support of children, uh, these are difficult times. Uh, we will take care of business. I will continue to update you. And I have every confidence that Mr. Demetrio will deliver us a balanced budget on June 30th. And then we will uh, take the actions to have that come to reality. So I just wanted to share that with you. I've said that privately, but not in public. And I felt like it was time to do so. Thank you. So um, Dr. Swift or Mr. Demetrios, we have to approve by June 30th. 
So, and I believe we have five meetings left. Could you help remind us, please, when we'll see what? I apologize that it dawned on me a couple minutes ago that I should have had Ms. Helton put the calendar up that we've referred to, and we don't have that in front of us. Our hope is to pass the budget on the first meeting in June. We always hold the second meeting in June in case of an emergency because you all are obligated by law. Um, so, uh, and then we back up from there to the public notice, uh, the budget uh, meetings that we'll have or briefings that we'll have uh, to make sure that our employees and that our community are aware of the budget that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that.